Ah, <sighs> the weather is really fucking bad out today. It really is. But um, good morning. Happy Saturday. Hope everyone's keeping well. Hope everyone's keeping safe at this really, really tough time. Let's brighten up our spirits this morning. Uh, whichever day you're watching, could be a Saturday, could be a Sunday, could be next week, could be any day. But as long as you're watching, hope you're having a good morning or good evening or a good day or a good night. I don't know. Just I hope you're keeping good. That's all. That's that's all I hope for. And welcome. I don't have an official name for it just yet. I'm still gonna <clears throat> kind of testing the waters with this and seeing how it goes. But uh, as soon as I know, you guys know. This is merely just a little introduction to the video as today we're going to be talking about the history of the moving picture. Um, I just hope you all enjoy it. Hope you all uh, learned something from this as much because I certainly did anyways. So I shall see you all at the end of the video and hope you enjoy. This is the history of the moving picture. This, said by a man who would come to create the first ever invention of the moving picture. Photography already played a big part in the public during the mid 19th century, especially during the Civil War. The year was 1888 when an inventor, Thomas Edison, and his partner, William Dickinson, started to worry that others were gaining ground in camera development. But, before we get into the details, let me show you something. In 1834, several inventors came up with the idea of a simple toy that made it possible for a series of photos to be viewed in rapid succession, creating an illusion of motion. This was called the zoetrope. In 1878, Scientific American published a series of pictures taken by English photographer Edward Muybridge, depicting a horse in full gallop, along with instructions to view them through a zoetrope. This was mainly for a bet between himself and the Californian businessman Leland Stanford and his colleagues. He told Mybridge to take photos of the positions of a horse's hooves in rapid succession. What you're seeing here is the first ever moving picture in history. It's fair to say that Mybridge had won the bet. But this was only the beginning of something that would change the way we can create art. Meanwhile in Paris, noted physiologist Etienne Jules Mary was doing similar work. His studies of animals in motion drove him to experiment with photography, and he fashioned a camera that could take 12 pictures per second of a moving object. The technique, called chronophotography, along with Mybridge's work, were the founding concepts for motion picture cameras and projectors. Now, where do Edison and Dickinson come into the picture? Fuck you, asshole. In 1888, the pair set out to create the first ever motion picture camera, the kinetograph in 1890, and the kinetoscope in 1892 which was the machine that could project the moving images onto a screen. In 1894, Edison initiated public film screenings and recently opened kinetograph parlors. Now, keep in mind, this was 1894. The films themselves were primitive, nothing more than commonplace occurrences. But this was revolutionary for the time and paved the way for future inventors and future filmmakers. Soon enough though, filmmakers would start to incorporate storylines and music into their works. Between the years of 1890 to 1927, thousands of silent films were produced, with ever increasing sophistication of storyline and technical craftsmanship. This was called the silent era. Silent films were just that, films which did not have music nor talking within them. To provide a sense of emotion and drama and even excitement to the movies, live music was played in sync with the action on the screen, with the use of pianos, organs and other instruments. Some famous examples of such are Ben-Hur, The Ten Commandments, The Circus and many many more. This era of film also brought about many silent movie stars, such as the Charlie Chaplin, Laurel and Hardy, Harold Lloyd and Pearl White. This first phase of motion pictures emphasized reproducing human motion. The second phase started to move beyond this and began to tell stories. 
Edwin Porter's 1903 film, The Greatest Train Robbery, is a good example of the storytelling nature of its films and its use of continuity. The early films were quite short, usually no longer than 5 to 8 minutes. They were given the name one reelers, as they only used just one reel of film. Let's talk about one of the earliest dynamic directors, D.W. Griffith. He worked for Biograph in New Jersey and produced literally thousands of one reelers in the period from 1908 to 1912. A director like Griffith might be expected to produce at least two one reel movies a week. Griffith and others in the industry wanted to move beyond the simple formula that characterized industry in the early 1900s. But industry owners were resistant, wanting to keep one reelers and limited storytelling. Consequently, the dissidents left the East completely and moved about as far away as they could get to Los Angeles. This was Beverly Hills. Griffith and others began to experiment with longer films, and Griffith produced the first successful full length feature film. Now, what do you think the film is? If you know anything about film, and you have any interest in how it started, then you obviously know about this film. Now, before we get, get into it, I can't go through the video without discussing the controversy surrounding this film. As it stands, Birth of a Nation is a highly racist story. The movie itself was adapted from a book called The Klansman by Thomas Dixon. The problem, as Dixon saw it, and as Griffith would present it in his movie, was the American Negro. Early scenes in the movie provide a historical overview for the entire era. One early scene shows the first slaves arriving in America and the subtitles note, The bringing of the African to America planted the first seeds of this union. True union is achieved by the end of the movie when two families are reunited through marriage and through white supremacy over blacks. The controversy over the movie comes from its idealized portrayal of slavery before the Civil War and its highly negative view of free blacks after the war. The movie shows the South Carolina state legislator under black control. The legislator and his black members are crazed. The black legislators are shown with their shoes off, guzzling booze and eating huge pieces of meat in a sloppy manner. They are also shown leering at white women. The racism of the movie led protests when it was shown and, in some cities, riots. Others objected to the fact that most of the blacks who appeared in the movie were really whites in blackface. With all that being said, the movie itself was revolutionary. This was the first successful full-length feature film. It cost $100,000 to make, but it brought in 18 million in revenues. It ran over three hours, was popular, controversial, and established Griffith as one of the nation's leading directors. Technically, it was of high quality, with close-ups, cross-cutting, fade-outs, dramatic lighting. It was a powerful story told with exciting techniques. The movie demonstrated the power and popularity of movies. It also showed that huge profits could be made. But let's move on, shall we? To the golden age of motion pictures. Nineteen twenty eight to nineteen forty eight. This was the golden age of American motion pictures. Attendance was going up steadily and there were some great movies. Movies were primarily entertainment in nature rather than serious or informative documentaries. They steered clear of controversy, they generally avoided depressing topics or too much realism. This was the dream factory. Movies began to develop into a series of formulas, each of which was successful. Some of these included westerns, adventure serials, horror, gangster, and musicals. Movie attendance had grown steadily after the coming of sound and the movement into the area of talkies, which was the name given to films which used sound within the piece. But in the period after World War II, movie attendance plummeted. Between 1945 and 1948, an average of 19 million tickets were sold each week. That dropped to a low of 45 million tickets in 1960. What happened? To put it simply, television came, and with that many people found it easier to watch movies at home rather than going out as much. Other factors involved the cost of movies, and the federal government's involvement. The movie industry responded, trying to woo viewers back with increasingly sophisticated techniques. These included widescreen or cinerama from 1952 onwards, 3D movies, and aromarama, which was smells released from your chair to correspond to scenes on the screen, for example jungle smells, incense, etc. Another version of this was smellivision, referred to as the smellies. By 1959, Hollywood was a TV town. It emerges as the biggest money maker for Hollywood. By 1958, an estimated 3,700 feature films had been sold or released to TV for an estimated $220 million. 
Sony introduced its Betamax half-inch home video cassette recorder, or VCR as it's known, in 1975. By 1989, two-thirds of American homes were equipped to tape off the air or to run pre-recorded tapes. The movie industry was booming. And here we are in 2020, where we can stream just about any movie we ever want. An industry that's worth 31.5 billion dollars. It truly is an art form like no other. Oof, it's the history of the moving picture. Damn. I, I still can't believe that the whole fucking industry is not even just over a century old. It really picked up so fast. Like, it, it's insane how fast the industry picked up. And um, I really hope you learned something today. I definitely did. Looking back over things that I learned last year and refreshing my mind about things as well on top of it. It's great. It's fantastic. Love it. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, and all that Gucci stuff. And don't forget to click the bell when you subscribe just to make sure that you keep on top of the videos that I'm making now and in the future. So, also one last thing before we end this video. Make sure you follow me on Instagram at TML underscore OFC because there I'll be posting the next two ideas on my story about uh, the next topic that I'm going to cover. I'm not going to tell you which ones they are just yet. You're just going to have to go check out my Instagram and follow and check the story because that's going to be posted after this video is out. And also, you, if you still haven't checked it out, check out my music. It will be description below. My SoundCloud will be there. My Spotify will be there and whatnot. So... Please do check it out, support it, whatever, listen to it, pass it around to someone who might like it. I don't know. I'm really proud of that stuff. And um, I shall see you all in the next video, which will be hopefully very, very soon. And always remember to live life with an attitude of gratitude. It's, it's a very, very good thing. And uh, enjoy your weekend or whichever day you're at today. And keep safe. We're going to get through this. All this horrible stuff. Have a good day.